Okay, it's a, it's a very great pleasure and uh, it's a really an honor to be invited here and to talk about my research department, which deals with simulation systems and medical informatics. And I tried to provide a really not boring uh, talk today by providing you a, 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 a number of examples of problems and solutions and talk a little about how we did find those solutions. So to give an overview where we are coming from, we are coming from the original Risk Institute. That's the Research Institute for Symbolic Computing of the Johannes Kepler University Linz. And this has been created as a spin-off to create the possibility to give all those basic research um, results into applied research. And we founded this research department for medical informatics in 2001. I'm proud to be one of the founders of this uh, institution. And our structure, our ownership structure is 80% of the Johannes Kepler University Linz and 20% of the state of the Upper Austria. We have four units in our research organization. We're dealing with the um, scope of logistic informatics, where they do software for planning, optimization, simulation, and control of processes. We have industrial software applications. They make software for simulation, analysis, and optimization in engineering disciplines, so from airplanes to production. Uh, we have the advanced computing technologies, which deals with high-performance software solutions, cloud computing, complex computing, to solve really um, um, calculation-intensive um, problems. And we have the medical informatics, where I want to talk more in detail today. So the medical informatics makes highly specialized software for modern medicine. That's what we... Uh, wrote on our doors when we founded our institution. And we're dealing with the systematic processing of data, information, and knowledge in medicine. OK, that's really general. Um, we're doing multidisciplinary research and development and have already more than 15 years experience. And I want to give you some of my experience here today in this talk. Uh, we are supporting medicine by IT in order to enhance diagnosis and or optimize processes. That's what we are doing. And during our uh, experience the last 15 years, we learned here one of the most important things. We are talking to a different domain. We are talking to doctors. We are talking to physicians. Is any one of you a physician or a doctor? OK, so I can speak free. Uh, what they think what they say and what they really need are three completely different things. And it's our task to find the solution together in cooperation with them to give them those tools they really need. Because first they come and say, we want to have a one-button-click solution for this complex problem. And this is not always uh, possible. And they are not always able to say what they want because they don't understand our domain of IT simulation, um, medical simulation. And we don't know exactly about their domain. So it's not possible for everyone to make a study in medicine in addition and for them in statistics and informatics. Uh, the time is too short. Yeah. And I want to mention that we are founded by the Upper Austrian Strategic Economic and Research Program Innovatives Oberösterreich 2020, which is a great opportunity because we have the, the possibility to bring projects really to the end. So we are addressing and solving issues in biomechanical modeling and simulation, medical image processing in general, medical education and training systems, and expert-driven data analysis. And I want to show you today four problems and our approach to those solutions. The first one is the determination of burn surface 
so we worked with burn surgeons together, is difficult and error prone. Strabism surgeries, surgeries of the eyes, are really hard to plan to get the desired result. The surgery of intracranial aneurysms is very hard to train. I'll tell you why afterwards. And data analysis in medicine is really limited because the medical person doesn't have a study in statistics, mathematics. He's trained to make operations on the patient, but he's the one who knows about his domain. So I'll talk to all of those four more in detail. Let's start with the first problem. And by the way, if you lose my talk, you can start again by every problem. So let's start. The problem one has been the determination of burn surface areas difficult and error prone. So it's always in our problems, in our projects, the first step. What exactly is the problem and why is it a problem? The body is a complex geometric structure. Yes, we know it. Body is changing during growth. And there's a really, really high inter-rate um, variability between doctors doing this assessment. So we have poor compatibility for scientific work and for research outcomes. So the problem has been issued years ago by plenty of doctors. They tried to make some uh, estimation methods. Like you can see here, this is a chart where you can draw a little and it gives you just a hint of how to assess this burned area. But this is really error prone and it's proved in scientific that this is really not very close. So we want to know it ourselves. So we went to two um, big conferences of burn surgeons and we asked them, uh, more than 200 burn doctors, how big is this burn? On the first conference, they said us, in average, it's 9.4% of the total body surface area. On the second one, they told us it's 7.8% of the total body surface area. So we created a computer model and did a measurement. And the computer said to us, it's 3.6. That's 80 to 176 overestimation. And OK, so the doctor said, what? OK. Um, as you can see, um, even the 25th percentile is far higher than the computer determined um, um, area. And the doctor said, why? What's the problem? Especially the young doctors. And we discussed and searched in literature, and it is really essential because the burn size and the burn depth are the most crucial facts for burn injuries. And this starts with the decision, do we have to transfer this patient to the burn center or not? How much, how should we calculate the fluid resuscitation? Um, there had been big problems during the couple of the last years because they calculated too much because of the overestimation and they gave him almost twice of, twice of the necessary fluid, fluid resuscitation and this caused kidney problems up until the death of the patient. And they didn't know why. So they corrected the uh, usual formula down to avoid this problem. Um, and it's very important for evidence-based evaluation and prediction for multicenter studies and benchmarking to have an objective way of assessing burn injuries. So our approach is a three-dimensional one, which gives a simulated patient, which is adapted to the real patient. So you see here the three-dimensional model where you can enter those burn injuries. And the doctor said, nope, our patient has 100 kilograms, not like this 60. So we created some algorithms to expand those models in a very pragmatic way 
There is no time for 3D scanner. We know that the 3D scanner can be more accurate, but that's not the correct solution at this place. We need it just by three parameters, height, weight, and age. And it should be as good as possible. And now in the system, they have the possibility to mark the burned areas. OK. They can rotate it to any directions and uh, mark those areas. And then the doctor said, OK, we have pictures. Can't we take those pictures, put into the system, project it to the three-dimensional model, and bring this automatically to the model? Yes. We did it. They were very happy with it. And this is a really good solution for uh, bringing really objective assessment for this very important medical fact. So you can drive, um, um, draw different depths of burn. You can document everything. You even can document surgical procedures. And this is a very big advantage. We've proved this and developed this with the biggest burn unit in Europe, with the um, um, UKB in Berlin. And they are really using it for communication. Because imagine the doctor has to do the surgery. and if this is a complex surgery, he's using paper to draw on a model. And the nurse, in the next morning, tries to identify what the doctor meant on this sheet of paper. They're still using paper. And it's almost impossible to, if ever write, uh, try to read a handwriting from a doctor. Yeah. And we want to avoid this. And they're really happy with this solution. Then we integrated, um, in addition to the burn depth, uh, a little, um, uh, to, to the burn extent, a little um, an option to integrate the burn depth. There are two options we have. One is a multispectral camera, uh, which analyzes the burn depth, and the other one is a um, laser Doppler in imaging. And here in this video, it already started. You can see the whole thing in action. Um, take a picture, bring the picture to the, to the model. Then the picture will, aligned, will be aligned to the model. Um, this can be done automatically by computer algorithms. And then those false color information from this burn depth determination system will be transferred to the three-dimensional model, and you have the um, extent of the different burn sizes in just a couple of seconds. So here you can see the result. What the system can do in the back, of course, is the system knows where is the burn, on which body region is the burn, how deep is the burn, so it can do all those medical um, uh, encoding, which is very laborious for the doctor usually. Um, they can it can be done by the system automatically. So, and then we had the problem that we didn't have correct measurements uh, for children, because the data for children, which is used even for the percentile um, curves, which you can find at your children's doctor, are already about 70 to 80 years old. It doesn't really represent our, uh, our children nowadays. So we took this opportunity to go into a cooperation with the um, LFKK Linz, which is part of the Medical University uh, of Linz, and did a study with 25 body shape measures uh, of children in the age between 0 and 18. And we created a plug-in for the open source software Make Human, which allows to adapt any model to this measurements. So by adapting, we can just enter the values from the study, and the system creates automatically a correctly adapted anatomical model. So here are just some examples of those models. And the doctors were re really happy with this. And there's much potential to even use it outside of burn surgeons. So I want to 
to give you just a small example how those, all those pictures are come to this model. This is done by the computer automatically by rotating the model to the picture, continue the rating, finding the correct image, and finally they get the result, which is suitable for any medical study um, in seconds. What we are currently working on are really fat people. We have we presented this in America, and they said, yeah, it's cool, but we need it for Americans. Um, we are al already working on this, and yeah, here you can see some example result of body growth, and this can be of interest for plenty of medical situations. It's even available on an app, this is especially important for paramedics to um, decide whether to transfer uh, a patient to the burn unit or not. And to sum it up, concerning learning and training, it's used in trainings for paramedics and emergency doctors. The accuracy in burn size determination is gaining by using this method, just by using it. I talked to plenty of doctors who had this in his hospital, and then we, he went to another hospital, and they really improved their estimation even without making the software because they learned from the software. So the, the users got the feeling of correct values just learning from this simulation, even if they don't have the app at place. Okay. So. For anyone who lost me, I'm starting with problem two. <laughs> this is a little shorter. Um, it's about strabism surgeries. Strabism surgeries are really hard to plan. What's our motivation? Um, the diagnosis and therapy of squinting is very difficult. Um, it highly depends on empirical values. There are some static descriptions of those response mainly in books. Those are just tables. And the, the, in complex cases, the doctors use those numbers from those books, and several surgery, surgeries are necessary to receive the desired result. And that's what we want to avoid. We want to, especially if we have a child here, we want to uh, provide them a possibility to better plan the surgeries that they can do it in one surgery. Yeah, the, the idea of a model for this complex mechanical system, the eye, is not new. They already started in 1845 with building models, but the models have some limitations. Um, you can't do any parameterization for the for, for the volume of the eye or of any pathology. Um, they have been used primarily for teaching and, and training purposes, but even for planning. And here comes up our idea, what we want to do. We want to overcome all those limitations and create an electronic one, a virtual ophthalmotrop, um, which uh, has no drawbacks concerning those listed here, and even will solve the problem of the decreasing commercially availability of those things, because they don't produce it anymore. They have been invented in the last century. Um, so what's the problem exactly? The human eye is a really complex mechanical system. It has six eye muscles, and, and even um, Inversions from, from the brain through the nerves. So the real problem is to find the correct pathological situation. Um, so something if, if if you have if you want to um, make a strabism surgery, you have to search what's wrong first. And that's what we are doing. So we have this virtual of Dalmatrop, which um, helps us to determine the optimal uh, surgical intervention by following this process. I'm skipping here a little over. 
Um, the first thing is the parameterization of the real measured data from the patient. And this is what we're calling the pathology fitter. It's, it's very important for a biomechanical model to behave like the real eye. And this, this can't be measured. You can't measure the strength of the muscles which are, which are scoped to be treated by a surgical procedure. Um, but you can uh, make a, a comparison of your simulation with the real patient data as long as you have reached the real pathologic situation. And then you know what's really about. And when we know what's really about, we can plan uh, the surgery itself. Which muscle do we have to treat in which um, position and with which treatment option to get the optimum result? And we can train, the doctors can train with the system. Um, they can try out um, different uh, uh, procedures to see what's the result. And once they get the correct result, they have decided for the correct um, operation procedure. Just an example. We have here the green line is the, is the measured line. That's a so-called HES test. And this is a standardized diagram. So the patient with the left eye, you can see the green, is, 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 is moved to the middle. The green position is how he looks. So he looks with the left eye inside. We have to correct this. Um, first, we have to find the pathologic situation. And here you can see the red line is the one which is simulated by the system. And the red line of the left eye, which you can see on the, on, the, on the top left, should be almost the same like the green. It's not exactly the same, but it's a very good approach to be as closest. There can be plenty of uh, patho pathologies, and it's our aim to fight, find the correct one. Then you can try out your um, surgical procedure by just moving a muscle, doing some operational procedures on this muscle, and this moving of the muscle really starts the simulation. And it gives me immediately a result of how good is the result. And we can see here again, the green one has been the measured one. This is bad. The blue one is the perfect view, and the red one is the outcome if I'm taking exactly this surgical procedure I just tried out in my simulation. And this is almost perfect. This m would mean a posterior transposition of the left medial rectus and the application of the left lateral uh, rectus muscle to do this surgery. And I'm really happy because I have a, a daughter, which is eight years, and she had to do this operation and I planned it together with the doctors and I was really, really happy to have this system. And they did it just in the first surgical procedure and, was, and it is a and perfect result. So yeah, it's very good work of the doctors and we are very proud to support them. So what's going on in this um, research project next? We are modeling currently on nerves. Um, because nerves are transmitting interventions from the brain. So if you have some neuro neurological um, issues, we want to simulate this as well in our model. You can see those nerves are already um, integrated into the model, and there are some nerve modification points which enables um, the doctor to pin on a nerve and say how much this... Um, this nerve is paralyzed and gives more possibilities for, uh, for, for more exact simulation, exactly finding the pathology. Yeah, so to sum up, learning and training in this project, it's used in education for students of eye surgery and optics. They're using it all over Austria and it's spreading 
more than all over Europe. They can simulate in training pathology and surgery, and that's the important fact that even the pathology, which is hard to find, can be trained and uh, treat, treated correctly. And it's been as virtual of Dalmatrop, which is commercially, uh, the, 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 the old one is commercially not available anymore, so you don't need to buy one, you can use this uh, virtual one. And we are pretty sure that this is an option to replace those old mechanical things. Okay, problem three. So, anyone who wants to start again, um, it's the last but one opportunity because I have just four problems. It's about surgery of intracranial aneurysms. And this is hard to train. What are aneurysms? Aneurysms are balloon-like deviations of vessel walls. Um, if they rupture, um, this, um, th this will bleed into the brain issue and will cause a hemorrhage. So this shouldn't happen. Um, the incidence of this is 5 to 8 percent of the population. And this is really high, especially if we have um, smoking women above 40, stop smoking. Um, as <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but the statistics don't lie. Uh, there are two kinds of therapies. We have the minimal invasive uh, therapies, which is, has is been done by the radiologists. It's stenting and coiling. They put a coil into this balloon and a stand so that, that the blood flow is, is corrected in the right position. And the second one is surgical clipping, where you have to open a craniotomy, open the head, and put this clip onto this balloon. Okay, we have two procedures. Why is it a problem? Um, the problem just came up a couple of years ago because the majority of the aneurysms are coiled because this is a pretty new technology and it's minimum invasive and it has not this risk than just opening the head and putting a clip in it. And only the very difficult aneurysms still have to be clipped. So coiling for simple ones, clipping for the complex ones. Okay, so everyone is coiling. And especially in Austria, we had the problem in our local hosp hospital that we had five neurosurgeons who have been able to do this clipping. Three of them are already retired. And the next two will get retired in five years. So we have a lack of possibility of training this clipping procedure. And that's why we came into, um, into the game. And we said our goal is to create a training simulator for clipping surgeries. It has a name, virtual aneurysms. It should be realistic. It should give, give haptic feedback. It should give feedback of quality of my surgical procedure and it should allow, allow to train the whole process and allow to virtually plan and surgery. So everything starts with a standard uh, computer uh, uh, tomography where we build out our three-dimensional structures. No? Yeah. So we make a 3D reconstruction of the vascular geometry um, in kind of voxel data. Then we are segmenting those areas where the aneurysms are located. As you can see here, we provided them some algorithms to remove of artifacts, noise, so we use Gaussian smoothing for that. And then we can calculate all those aneurysms me measurement, diameters, plot volume, length, width, volume, which even is important for the coiling, because the coiling, usually they don't see how much coil they have to put in it. And by calculating it first, they can do a pre-calculation, which 
really increased the results. Out of this, we are generating a blood mesh. So for numerical simulation, which we are doing afterwards, discretization here is necessary. We are partitioning this into healthy area and the aneurysm, and we define blood inlet and blood outlet for our simulation. And in the next step, you can see here, this is the fluid structure interaction, which is calculated on a very basic physically way, uh, which shows the velocity and wall displacement. You can see the velocity field at maximum inflow. You can see the particle path over time, the trajectories, which is very important to see how the blood flow in this aneurysm actually occurs and how should I place my clip on it. And here as well, you can see this in real time with the heartbeat, where are the big the, 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 the most important areas, where is the pressure, and you even can assess with this how high is the risk of this aneurysm to rupture. And this can be a very important fact in future because not all aneurysms are dangerous. There are so many aneurysms, I said 5 to 8% of the people have an aneurysm, but mostly don't recognize ever. And Usually, they are found during a routine control if they are searching for anything else. And yeah, if we have a possibility to assess and prove that this aneurysm isn't dangerous, this could avoid an operation which even has some risks. So, we had to do a haptic simulator setup, so we used those um, consumer devices for haptic feedback. You have already heard about them yesterday. Uh, 3D vision system, um, everything already presented. And we had to mount this clip applier. The doctors want to have their own clip applier into hand. They don't want to have a joystick or something else. So we gave him the, p the possibility to mount this clip applier. Um, the clip library, uh, it, it was amazing. I've, I've been in Germany in the, um, in the manufacturing company. They are producing this tool and I expected a very huge uh, a machine. No, there have been just people sitting here and making them by hand. It's very interesting because they're all handcrafted and there exists about 200 different types for every kind of aneurysm. And it's very bad to try them out during the operation because with every try of setting a clip, you will damage the surface of the, of the blood vessel. So you should plan this in prior to have the correct um, clip at hand. So this is just a short walkthrough through this virtual aneurysm. First, you choose your training scene, or you can choose the real patient, choose your clip applier, choose the clip. Make yourself familiar with the 3D angiogram, search for the aneurysm, where is it? Okay, it's over here. Yeah, this we want to treat. Then we have to find the optimal head position and perform the craniotomy because it's of a big advantage if we don't cut off the half of the head. So keep it, keep it as, 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 as narrow as possible. Um, so we integrated this opportunity to plan. And then let's go inside. He has usually his 3D um, glasses on and places this clip. You can see here the force and friction of the clip and everything. And then it comes to one of the most important things the doctors wanted, the result assessment. The trainees get penalties for number of clips they're trying, number of clips they're repositioning. Of course, if they rupture the aneurysm, um, if they make some arterial stenosis, um, if they still reside some 
um, areas from the aneurysm, which is even more dangerous than not to treat it, and for long durations. And this core is generated automatically to give the trainee a correct feedback. So to sum it up, what have we learned? What, what we, are, we are doing here by learning and training? Um, haptic training simulator is used in education for young surgeons. This is really a big beneficial. Feedback and the assessment of quality enables, enables a better learning curve because they get feedback. What did they wrong? How good has the simulation been? And yeah, to train this surgical procedure virtually on the data of the patient prior to the real surgery can help us to find the correct clip prior to the, um, to the real surgery. And maybe in future, sometimes we can adapt and create the perfect clip for exactly this, um, this aneurysms. I know. Um, I didn't want to hurry during all, so I'm stopping here. <laughs> yes, yes, right. Okay, so we, 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 we skipped the fourth. Oh, it doesn't make sense. I just have one slide in there. <laughs> it's, it's all about... Um, I can talk one, one sentence to it. It's, it's all about finding data in big databases. Um, even here we have the problem, the doctor is not a statistician and he's not a, he, he didn't study ma mathematics and we want to provide him a tool where he can use his experience of the medical domain for understanding medical data and associations for finding theories, hypotheses, and further for further investigations and research without doing a study in statistics. So we are pri providing modern machine learning methods for him. And to sum it up, we, are, we solved the problem with the burn, with the eye surgery, with the intracranial aneurysms, and we skipped the data analysis in medicine, and I would thank you very much for your attention. Do you find um, making use of this technology changes the kind of people and the kind of skills needed now in medicine? Um, yes and no. Um, so we, we are enabling uh, new quality improvement uh, for the existing doctors. We don't want to replace them. And I think the demand is more in institutions like we are, who are able to work with doctors to understand the medical domain at least as much as it, need, as it is needed to, to find the solution they really need. So I think there's big potential in the combination of medical informatics and but the doctors should say this sh stay the same they just should be supported the various examples that you showed us the feedback that you're receiving um are there differences in the way that these are accepted in the medical community or is everything always positive or are there certain gradations of how this is being received that's, that's very interesting, especially for the um, burn topic. I'm dealing with this topic since 15 years, and here I always say it's a generation. It's a new generation coming up. We have we had plenty of surgeons prior three years to retirement. They say, we don't need this. We have done this the last 40 years like we've done it. And it was very interesting that um, they getting retired and, and suddenly the phone called and the young doctor called, you have this burn 3D documentation, we are interested in having it. So I think it's, it's coming and we shouldn't stop it, we should give him a push. <laughs>